There is a story in ancient Western literature about a woman named Leda. Her beauty attracted the attention of the god Zeus, who descended from heaven. To avoid the anger of his wife, he came in the shape of a swan. Some versions of the story say he raped Leda. Other Other versions of the story say that the god seduced her. The confusion between rape and seduction did not end with the ancient Greeks, nor did a lot of other confusion about the subject. The Federal Bureau of Investigation's crime statistics show that there were 46,430 reported forcible rapes in the United States in 1972. But, says the FBI, most rapes are unreported. There were at least three times that number actually committed. Some authorities believe that only one in every ten rapes is reported. In short, there may be nearly a half million rape victims this year. Very few of those rapes will be reported. Fewer of those cases will go to trial. And very few rapists will be convicted and sentenced. 360 rapes were reported in Columbus in 1973. The Uniform Crime Report finds that 2% of rapes may be unfounded, but the Columbus Police Department considers a startling 20% unfounded. Of the good rape reports, they arrested 74% of the suspects. Of the 218 arrests, Only 87 men were brought to trial, and the court obtained only 17 convictions. 63 cases were dismissed, and seven were plea bargained to lesser charges. The Ohio law on rape uh, in the new criminal code that just went into effect in 1974 reads as follows. No person shall engage in sexual conduct with another, not the spouse of the offender, when any of the following apply. The offender purposely compels the other person to submit by force or threat of force. So that means that rape can involve any kind of sexual conduct, uh, which means more than simply uh, vaginal intercourse. Uh, What sexual conduct means is uh, also defined in the code, and that is vaginal intercourse between a male and female, anal intercourse, fellatio cunnilingus between persons regardless of sex, Penetration, however slight, is sufficient to complete vaginal or anal intercourse, which means that emission is not necessary uh, to constitute the offense of rape. That definition also indicates that the the husband of a woman may not legally be guilty of raping her. Uh, He may, in fact, force her to submit to sexual intercourse, but he may not be convicted of rape. The definition of force uh, and threat of force uh, requires only that the, uh, the woman submit because of threat of force. She doesn't have to be in fear that she's going to be killed, uh, as is required in some jurisdictions. Uh, it's not required either that she must have physically resisted uh, before the man can be guilty of rape, though it will be easier uh, f- for the prosecution to get a conviction if she, in fact, did uh, resist uh, physically. Of course, it depends upon more than who does the better job. It depends upon the mental set of the people who are doing the judging. It depends upon the mental set of the judge and the mental set of the jury. And probably to an even greater extent on the mental set of the prosecutor. What does the prosecutor think about women? Do they really get raped? Or or can't they run faster with their skirts up than a man can with, with his pants down? And if a prosecutor has that mental set, then he is likely, he may want to fight hard. He may really want to convict that rapist, but he just doesn't have the mental tools to do it because his assumptions parallel the assumptions of the defense lawyer that, you know, you really can't thread a moving needle. And those two two examples are ones that we hear around courthouses all the time. They're part of the very... uh, sexist way that judges and prosecutors and defense lawyers deal with rape. 
You know, in our society, we have this belief that uh, that women are really divisible into two kinds. There's the kind of woman who is the childhood sweetheart, the nice woman who lives next door, door and who becomes our wives. And then we have another view of women, and they are the harlots and the strumpets and the street walkers and those kinds of women who men use so that they won't have to use the sweethearts who will become their wives. And a lot of what happens around a rape case is trying to make the victim appear to be the harlot strumpet tart and not the woman next door. Now, if we're realistic about it, we know that women aren't divisible into two kinds, that there are lots of kinds of women, just as there are lots of kinds of men. And so the whole process of the rape case, when you see it happening in the courtroom, is more often than not the jockeying between those positions, which takes you back to what I said earlier about uh, you know, how does the defense portray the victim, or how does the prosecution portray the victim? The defense attorneys come back, and we've had women come to us and telling us uh, questions they were asked, such as, what bra size do they wear, or what were your measurements, or um, do you always wear short skirts, or are you aware that you don't look like you're 19, even if you are 15, you know, or, or that you look 19 when you are only 15? The police can give you that same kind of hassle. But these aren't relevant questions. They're, they're making the woman look as though she provoked a rape. And a woman cannot possibly provoke the violence that is incurred by rape. There is no way a woman can be responsible. Women are harassed on the streets. Women are constantly being uh, touched on the streets by men passing by. They're constantly being uh, called to by men passing in cars. Women cannot take the responsibility for causing that or provoking it. So let's start putting it on the real guilty party. Let's start working on some of the men, or at least make the women aware that the fact that they do not have to feel guilty simply because they're a woman and simply because men take this attitude toward women that they are to be used or that they are simply there to be used. Yeah, I see, um, I see students at the um, Student Health Center who may come in as a result of a rape um, perhaps because they're traumatized over the situation or um, <clears throat> maybe even they've become pregnant. I have seen one woman who, a 17-year-old woman who has become pregnant as a result of a rape. It was also her first sexual experience. Um, so I work with these students. Um, one recently came in and was seen by one of the male therapists. Um, I was on vacation at the time, and um, she didn't go back to her appointment with him and subsequently asked if she could see me. And she told me that um, she felt very uncomfortable talking with him, that he seemed very unsympathetic. Um, he was just getting the facts and really <clears throat> she had come for some emotional support that she didn't feel she could get from him. I think another operative factor there was that this woman um, was raped as a result of um, being in a group with um, some other people and was the last to be dropped off at home, although before she was dropped off home, he took her to his home and raped her. Um, she didn't um, go into the car with him initially with the notion that he was a rapist or that she was going to be raped by him. Um, I think she uh, has a mistrust in men now that seems um, understanding under the circumstances that a man doesn't necessarily have to look uh, seedy and dirty and um, unusual <laughs> to be a rapist. Um, so 
perhaps this may have been operating when she was talking to the male therapist. Um, this woman, too, is, um, is prosecuting her case and is having some problems from home with her mother um, not being too pleased that she's prosecuting, feeling that the neighbors and the friends are going to find out and what will that say about the mother, about the family, about uh, in some way that the girl's a loser that she was raped, that somehow she had um, asked for it, um, which seems pretty ridiculous. Um, Very little is actually known about rape. But the few statistical studies which have been made lead to some very startling conclusions. Rape is a premeditated crime. 75% of rapes are planned. This does not support the idea that rape is the result of an overwhelming, sudden sexual urge. Rapes do not happen only in dark alleys or to women who hitchhike. One-third of all reported rapes occur in the victim's own home. Half of all reported rapes occur indoors. The rapist is not necessarily a stranger. In 48% of reported rapes, the offender is known to the victim. It is probable that large numbers of unreported rapes involve an offender known to the victim. Interracial rapes are rare, accounting for only 7% of reported rapes. White women are usually raped by white men. Black women are raped by black men. When there is an interracial rape, it is most often a white man who rapes a black woman. Uh, even a woman who knows all that will accept these two myths without thinking. The first is what you might call the dark alley myth, which is that rape is something that happens when a stranger grabs you and drags you off the street into a dark alley or breaks into your house. The other myth, which is really the other side of the same coin, is that rape is something that only happens to other women. What women are going to have to understand is that most rapes are not committed by strangers, although some of them obviously are. In fact, most rapes and most violence against women are committed by husbands, boyfriends, boyfriends, brothers, and other men close to the victim. Are you going to be able to edit that? Mm -hmm. OK. Further, we have to realize that rape not only can happen to each of us, but it probably already has happened to most of us. Now let me tell you a little story about a man who was a, a prosecutor in this county. He belonged to a luncheon club, and the luncheon club was made up of businessmen. I mean, they were really the, the highest sort of people in our society. Uh, they they had much to do with the law and to do with business and industry. And it was their custom to give gifts. And this prosecutor hit upon a novel idea for a gift. He would go to his files and he would get indictment forms, which are printed forms with blanks. And there's a blank for the name of the defendant and in there he would fill in the name of a club member. And then there's a blank for the date, and he would fill in a recent date. And then there's a blank for the kind of crime, and the kind of crime would be rape. And he would give these presents, which were framed indictments charging the crime of rape, to the male friends in his club. And this would supposedly signify that they were strong, aggressive, males with hard sexual tendencies as proved by the fact that they'd been charged with the crime of rape. And this prosecutor couldn't understand any reaction to that fake rape indictment 
except the one that he intended. He couldn't understand that someone would be bothered by it and that that's the right view. I think that we have, the, as individuals, we have the power to change the way we look at sex, just as we do everything else, and that males ought not to be aggressive, and that if we're going to be really responsible about this sex thing and about this rape problem, then we ought to change the way we look at sex, and we ought to, to tell men that violent aggression in the field of sexual activity is not proper, that there's not a social value behind it, that men are not more attractive to women simply because they're bigger and stronger and more aggressive in their sexual appetites. So that hopefully there will get away from the kind of social plus about rape that is suggested by the prosecutor's fake indictment. I mean, for him to give these to his friends and for his friends to accept them means that they have some value. And how could it possibly be of value for a man to be indicted for a crime? But it's of value to be indicted for this specific crime, to be virulent enough, violent, aggressive, strong, male enough to be indicted for rape. Oh, and his, his aside was that for a special friend, he had him indicted of three counts of rape all in the same day. Again, to show the huge sexual appetite. And unless we get that kind of poison out of our society, then, then we're going to have people constantly acting out that kind of sexual fantasy. And they'll be acting out that sexual fantasy on your daughter and mine. Peck and Post films, the, the woman is very rarely regarded sympathetically. Um, her feelings simply don't exist. Her reactions to rape are uh, almost negative. She simply is raped, uh, and uh, that's the end of that. Uh, we don't know how she feels, how she might suffer. So you're Aren't saying the director's treating her as a thing, too? As an object. Definitely. She is right, treated as, as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as an object for, for sexual titillation uh, and, and, uh, and simply as an object with, with no feeling. She is less than human in these situations. And this invites the audience to, to do the same, to treat, you know. Absolutely. To regard the, the, the rape victim as less than human. And as available, approachable in these terms um, as, and, and there, there are no consequences no serious consequences from it. Okay, and films are not alone in doing this. 20th century uh, uh, literature is, uh, uh, as well is full of rape for the, uh, the violence sake, for the aspect of, uh, of uh, uh, for no other integral reason to the plot other than to provide violence and uh, sensationalism. Um, oh no, let me pick up one. <laughs> I can't Just accuse Faulkner of doing that. No, I can't accuse Faulkner of doing that. Certainly rape is integral there, but uh, again, you certainly find a, uh, a lack of sympathy, I think, even in Faulkner, a lack of sympathy for the victim. Uh, that is, I'm thinking of late in August, in which uh, there is a, uh, a quite violent rape takes place, but it is thoroughly enjoyed by the victim. Uh, and uh, which leads, in fact, to uh, not only her later accessibility, but to her later nymphomania. And this also occurs, although the victim is a little less willing in uh, Faulkner's uh, sanctuary, um, we find there again the victim degenerates then. This, uh, apparently this rape has sparked some grain of evil that was always there within her, and this then she uh, simply can submit then uh, she has the excuse to then give vent to her already, uh, uh, what, inherent nymphomania. Yeah, she's a rapey, potentially, anyway. Right. Uh, it merely takes the... Yeah, the, the, the whole idea that, that this character deserves rape. Right. Boy, is that ever one spread in our culture that women deserve. Right. Is there anybody who treats it differently in, in 20th century literature that you know of? No, but I can listen to Robert Herrick, the Kitty uh, yeah. Maids' nays are nothing. They are shy, but do desire what they deny. Uh -huh.
that's terrible to think that, 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 uh, that, that uh, here we all are waiting, wanting, just waiting to be raped. The people on the films, the, 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 the protagonists of the films, just waiting to be raped uh, uh, and deserving it because of the way they dress, because of the alluring quality they might have for men. And her protest means nothing because she doesn't really mean it. She's just merely going through a, a social, a social uh, convention so that he, so that he will respect her. Every woman wants to be raped. Well, it's always seemed to me that the damn few women ever raped didn't want to be raped. They wasn't looking for it. It wasn't out there inviting it. Asking me for it. And those ones that have been raped, maybe they didn't enjoy it or want it right at the beginning, but by God, they seem to enjoy it right afterwards. I mean, that seems to me to be one of the main things that it's it's these provocateurs. I mean, if uh, if a person's taking a, a whole tray of sweets and honeys down the street before starving people. Well, hell, they can't cry robbery any time somebody reaches over and grabs one of those uh, sweets or honeys. What's well, the same thing with rape. It's this element of the provocation. It's the provocation that brings on most of the rape. Now, I mean, women are go wandering around here. I mean, it's the way they dress, the way they talk. When they're being places, he showed me a woman that's been in a bar room and comes out crying rape. Hell, what'd she think when she went in there? <laughs> a woman who's been raped initially reacts with feelings of terror. It's a horribly traumatic experience. It's something that she's She's just never had any experience in any way similar to it. There's feelings of guilt. Some way she thinks she caused the rape. Um, she was in a bar and she allowed herself to get picked up by a man she didn't know. Uh, she should have locked the doors. She should have locked the windows. Something to that effect. She shouldn't have walked at night. She shouldn't have worn a halter top. She feels in some way that she had something to do with causing the rape. And of course, this is a ludicrous concept because rape is a premeditated crime. And so anything a woman does has nothing to do with the fact that she was raped. Another feeling that women have is feeling guilty and dirty. Showers, douching, anything she can do to just get the feelings of rape, of dirt, dirt off of her body. She'll, and of course, this, if you're going to take your, your case to trial, douching, taking a shower, washing, is destroying evidence. But it's a very difficult thing not to do. Women tend to feel isolated from everyone else because they can't understand what is she, she has gone through. Another interesting idea is how the rape victim feels about herself. And uh, we have very few women writers describing rape. Um, I was hard pressed to find examples. And one among them that I can come up with is Maya Angelou's book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, in which the young child, a child of eight, is, uh, I think she's eight, yeah, mm -hmm. eight, eight years old, and she is raped by um, a, uh, her mother's uh, common-law husband. And uh, she, her immediate reaction is one of guilt. She doesn't even want to tell anyone that she has been raped because she feels that in some way she has encouraged it because in some way, even though she, was, she did not enjoy it, nor did she un even understand what was going on, it was a terribly painful process for her and one that Maya Angelou, the author, simply uh, does not relate to us. We are just left with this ellipsis. We don't know what happens in the interim, just simply that it was intensely painful. Uh, but her immediate reaction is to feel guilt. Somehow, she feels she has led this man into this terrible kind of behavior. 
Why do women feel guilty about being raped? Consider this situation in a California school. Third grade girls complained that their male classmates were pinching them and that the boys were peeking into the girls' restroom. The teacher responded that the girls must have been teasing the boys. One child said to her mother, I guess we were teasing them, but I don't know how. I don't know what it was that we did. That's what had happened. And my father told me, rape is impossible. And that's what did it. The rape itself was not as bad. And I still, I, 18 years have gone by and I still get upset about it. I'm angry as the devil. And that's why I'm talking though. Because if anybody rapes my daughters and somebody tells them that rape is impossible, I, I just do anything rather than have that happen to them. Well, what did your mother say? My mother said a lot of she tried to rationalize my father's my father's disbelief and and try to explain to me how it really happened. Uh, and she started talking to me about how I had been drinking, and she thought that I had consented because I didn't know much about my body and I didn't know much about my sexual responses. She didn't say that, but she said some things I don't even want to repeat. But she believed that uh, it was my fault. My father believed it was my fault. The psychiatrist believed it was my fault. The only person who didn't believe it was my fault was my roommate, who came to rape as possible. That nobody else, I mean, that if, you know, you scream, rape is possible, rape happens, rape happens. It happened here, here, and here to these innocent people. That the most damaging part, I, I can accept responsibility for not having the circumspection to, you know, not go out with somebody I don't know terribly well and not let myself get in a position where I can't defend myself and where I can't be the master of my own fate. You know, to some extent, but um, I I can't. For, I what hurt most was was the response afterward, and that won't happen if, if women against rape and, and other things like that are publicized. One of the ways that women can receive support from other women is a rape crisis center. And the concept behind that is peer counseling, women helping other women with experiences that they both can understand, can sympathize and empathize with. When you go to the police, it's a totally masculine experience. Everyone around you is male. The walls are, are decorated in a male motif. It's very important at this time to have a strong woman friend with you who will hold your hand uh, who will be with you, who will tell you to be strong and let you know that everything's going to be all right. Also, this woman friend can help in more practical situations. She can participate in the police questioning of the victim and object to questions about the victim's past sexual experiences. Totally irrelevant questions that the police will tend to ask. This is an important thing for her to do. She can also follow up Go with the woman during the trial situation. Bring other women from the crisis center and have women receive support at the trial, at the police station, and at the hospital. This is what a rape crisis center is all about. Western capitalistic society stresses competition and achievement. Losers are not held in high regard. One avoids identifying with them. They are stigmatized for not winning in a competitive society. In general, victims are thought of as having asked for it and deserving whatever they get. 
Attempts are often made to find information that puts the victim in a bad light, so that, in effect, her misfortune was deserved, and therefore it was reasonable for her to become a victim and proper for her to suffer. In this way of thinking, fairness forbids that nasty things happen to nice people. A rape victim, therefore, is unlikely to relate and report her experience because she is incapable of disproving the anticipated allegation that she somehow provoked the rape by her presence or by her behavior, and that indeed it was not rape and that she should in fact blame herself. The basic dynamic operating in this kind of thinking is to shift the blame from the offender to the victim, emphasizing the victim's deserving characteristics. Thus, there was no injury, no offender, and no victim. In most people's idea of a just world, the bad girl deserves to be raped, and the rape victim, therefore, is a bad girl. Observers seem to question not only how did this suffering occur, but also why did this person suffer? The latter question can only be answered by inferring that the victim in some way deserved her fate, either because of her intrinsic unworthiness or because of her actual behavior. Even when a victim is someone who does not intrinsically merit suffering, when she is someone who is respectable, jurors will still find it necessary to attribute behavioral responsibility to the victim in order to justify her suffering. One of the things that I've seen happen over and over again would be that a mother would come in and rather than being worried about the girl, she would feel that she had done something. One of the things that I've heard said is, what did I do wrong? What did I forget to teach her? Uh, why couldn't I have, have taught her something that she wouldn't have let this happen to her? Um, just as, where's the rape? Things like that, that really tended to humanize her. And at this point, she's not ready to see men and deal with them often, but she expects a little better from women and usually doesn't get it. Um, there's usually a lot of discussion going on in an emergency room about the rape. Um, as much repulsion as people often feel towards a victim, there's still an amount of curiosity that goes along with it. And so the woman is often subjected to feeling that instead of hearing good things about herself, or at least neutral, she's listening to, uh, do you think it was real? Uh, do you think she asked for it? Do you think she really fought back? Those kind of things. She's made to feel guilty, not just because she was raped, but because she's there taking up these people's precious time. And the more comments that she hears about herself from outside the room, in the hallway, whatever, the more she feels that she's somehow a burden to the people who are taking care of her. She's often subjected to listening to the policeman's dirty jokes right outside the room. And she's not really ready for that. I don't think anybody would be, but particularly not at that point after that. Several other things about the whole rape business. It seems that that happens to be one of the few crimes that I can think about, especially where the victim is the one who essentially is flying in the face of public opinion. We ask, what in the world was she doing out at that hour? Why, what was she doing wearing something like that? It was expected that she should get into trouble. Um, has she ever had sexual intercourse with anybody other than someone to whom she was married? She has, well, that she was probably asking for it. And nobody takes into account, perhaps she had every reason to be out, perhaps in this society we can choose what we want to wear, when we choose to wear it, and why we choose to wear it. And as far as whether or not she's had any previous sexual encounters, I don't believe in our society that has become the criteria for determining whether or not you deserve to have a crime perpetrated on you.
Free Press, the article they did about, uh, they took a, they interrogated a man as they do a woman with regard to the various questions involved in a rape. You know, why, you can't expect if you were wearing a good looking business suit that somebody would not accost you in a neighborhood at night. You know, how perfectly ridiculous. And uh, now come on, tell us you really did want to get robbed. That's why you were down there. Tell me, come on, you know, <laughs> wink, wink. And uh, I just thought that was incredibly well done because it pointed out the absurdity of treating all women alike with regard to sex crimes. I'm sure there are some. Mr. Smith, are you the robbery at 16th and 4th Avenue? Yes, yes, I have. Tell me exactly what happened. Well, I was walking by the 16th Avenue bus stop, and th this man asked me for the time. And when I told him, he pulled a gun on me, and he, and he took my wallet and my watch. Did you struggle with the man at all? Uh, no. Did you resist? No. Did you try to run? No, he had a gun. Then you made a conscious decision to comply with his demands rather than resist. Yes. Did you scream or cry out? No, he had a gun. Did he hurt you? No. No bruises of any kind? No, I, I was afraid. May we check your underwear for perspiration or other stains? Stains can substantiate the claim of fright, you know. Well, you have to, it's for the investigation. held up before? No. Have you ever given money away? Yes, of course I have. And you did so willingly? Yes. What are you saying? Well, you've given money away in the past. It's possible you contrived to have this money taken from you by force. Just a possibility, you see. Never. I never would. Oh, good, good. I knew you didn't. Never contrived robbery. Have you ever seen the man before? No. Yes, I saw him once, and, you know, he asked me for the time then, too. So he was a friend? Of course not. I just spoke to him that once. Not a close friend. What time was this, please? It was about, uh, It's about 11 p.m. What were you doing on the streets at 11 p.m.? Walking. I was just walking. You know that it's dangerous being on the streets walking late at night. Weren't you aware of the fact that you could have been robbed while street walking? I hadn't thought of it that way. What were you wearing at the time, Mr. Smith? An evening suit. An expensive suit? Yes. Black tie, tails. Mm-hmm. Let's see. 
you were walking the streets late at night, wearing an expensive suit, been known to give away money, why, Mr. Smith, I mean, if we didn't know better, we might think that you were asking for this sort of thing to happen, kind of looking for the excitement of it all. What were you thinking at the time? Nothing. I... <clears throat> Just something to tell my doctor. Mm-hmm. Are you sick? No, it was my psychiatrist. Oh, I see. That kind of sick. What kind of work are you in, Mr. Smith? I'm in real estate. Oh, I can see that. You're very well dressed and very attractive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I try to keep myself up. Uh-huh. Likes to attract people. Anything else? What about the robber? Please, Mr. Smith, the alleged robber. We can't call anyone a robber until after the trial. Why don't you ask him to come into the station and we can talk about it. Me? He's your friend. Well, but I hardly know the man. Acquaintance, then. I don't know him at all. That's to be expected if you make those kind of relationships, I guess. We'll try to find him. But next time, use a little discretion in these loose or casual acquaintances of yours, Mr. Smith. Try to be more careful. Thank you. We'll be in touch. There again, I think that the only thing that we can do is try to apprehend the people after it happens. I feel that there are things that can be done that would possibly reduce rape, but I think many of these things would have to be done by the victim. Uh, I don't think changing laws is going to prevent something. Uh, I really don't know how good enforcement prevents something from happening. I know that people... Preventing rape. Yes, we can take self-defense courses and learn to fight back. That's important. Yes, we can push for stronger rape laws and see that rapists get prosecuted and convicted. Yes, we can support legislation that makes rape a non-probationary crime, that provides more funding for rape crisis centers. But those are only holding me measures. We're not going to stop the crime of rape until attitudes about women in this society change. Until women begin to be seen as human beings, as equal and participating people in this society, we're always going to have the crime of rape because women are seen as possessions, as sex objects, as a way of getting to other men through their women by raping women. We're not going to stop the crime of rape.
speaking to you, leader of the midnight dew. Is it the stars above your head, or the planet Jupiter so red, that's guiding you? Is it true? I can feel the joy that's meant for you. Hustling and fear are gone. We'll the solar system run a game on you and match you with a swan, a swan, a swan, a swan. Thank you. 